Five years ago, the Johnson family was destroyed in the villa, and all because the head of the family, out of his own kindness, decided to save the little girl, thereby offending influential people in the capital, and only one child wanted to fight back. But the boy accidentally survived by falling into a deep lake to spite his enemy. Now five years later, Michael Johnson has acquired enormous power, capable of instilling terror by summoning ghosts and spirits into the real world. He returned to shed blood and avenge his dead relatives. God returned to the world to take revenge, to kill. A girl walks through the heavily urbanized city of New York, full of cars and people. Then, for some reason, she is stopped by a guy unknown to her until that moment. The girl turns around and sees a guy who tells her that he sees her soul turning black and predicts today's bloodbath. He justifies this by saying that it would be better to shed a little blood and hurry to prevent the consequences. The heroine is very surprised by what was said, asking again as if trying to make sure that she didn't hear it wrong. She then calls the guy a dirty pervert, refuses to date him, and walks off into the sunset. The guy reflects on the fact that he was just kindly remarking, and he was already called a pervert, how quickly women have changed in New York. But in the end, this is not Chicago. Then Michael remembers that he was born into a happy family, but his peers always mocked him for belonging to the Johnson family. But five years ago it all ended because his father decided to save the little girl. But one high-ranking person did not like this, and therefore a few days later, during a banquet at the villa, the Johnson family was destroyed. Only Michael survived. All the family's friends did nothing and just stood and looked at such a tragedy. Michael was very angry at the killer of his family. He vowed to kill him no matter what. However, the boy's attack was unsuccessful, and the rich man only laughed at his stupid attempt. In the end, the mother miraculously managed to push the child into Lake Newark, where the master saved him and took him with him to Chicago, giving him the ability to summon ghosts and spirits. Now the master gave Michael the task of returning to New York, and he vowed that he would take full revenge. After his memories, the guy feels that his body does not move, and because of the oppressive atmosphere it becomes harder to breathe. He then notices the spirit that he assumes is to blame for these feelings and captures it. Passers-by on the street feel something strange, but cannot understand what exactly happened. Michael understands that before carrying out his revenge, he must first complete the task assigned to him. Apple is one of the 500 largest companies doing business in New York. Three days ago, the old man found out that within a hundred days, trouble would happen to Sarah Walsh, after which she would most likely die. The old man said that he had something with her grandmother, Maybe Sarah was his granddaughter. At the entrance to Apple, Michael Johnson is stopped by security guards. He wonders if they know a person named Sarah Walsh. The guards indignantly ask whether he has an appointment with the above-mentioned lady, to which he declares that he has a very important matter and they need to meet in person. The security doesn't want to let him in and doesn't believe him, saying that Michael needs to leave immediately while he's still alive. The guy uses his strength and makes the guards fall to their knees in a panic attack. The main character turns everything into a joke for those around him and goes about his business. He sits in a comfortable pale yellow chair in the organization's lobby and orders the chief to be called to him. People start to panic. Something strange is happening. Michael is confused. An armed detachment bursts in and encircles young Johnson. The head of security approaches the guy and threatens him with consequences for entering this office. Michael, in a rage, repeats everything he told the security earlier. The head of security senses that something is wrong with the guy and he is very strong, so he caves and says that Sarah is not in place today, but Michael can leave his contacts. The hero pretends to believe that his goal is not in the workplace, and therefore resigns himself to his fate. But he immediately reports that he still has nothing to do, so he can sit here all day, indifferently sending the squad to rest. The chief security officer is confused. He understands that he will lose his job if he does not drive Michael away, but he cannot do anything about it. Then he changes his mind and orders his men to seize the young man who broke into Apple. Some pretty girl with good shape and heels appears and orders the security to retreat. She attracts the attention of those around her and turns out to be a director named Jessica Nightingale, whose beauty can only be matched by President Sarah Walsh. The security officer tries to warn the headmistress about the danger, but she brushes his words aside like an annoying fly. Jessica introduces herself to the intruder and asks how she can help him. Michael peers at the director, and some images from the past begin to pop up in his head. He recalls that Jessica was his deskmate in elementary school, and that they had a great relationship until middle school. Johnson again falls back into the events of five years ago, seeing his return to the already sealed house after the incident. The whole city turned its back on his family, and an assassination attempt was made on his father's company. All of New York was at the mercy of one man, 
Despite the pressure from others, Jessica endured all the rumors and buried my parents on the mountain, placing a tombstone. Michael did not think that they would ever meet again. Now he is obliged to thank her somehow. Coming out of his memories, the guy finds himself too close to the girl, which she delicately hints at. Jessica repeats her question, to which the guy replies that he saw her somewhere. She is embarrassed and says that this is an old-fashioned way to start a conversation. The girl ends the conversation and despite the cries of the clerks, asks to leave the guy alone and not create so much useless noise. Michael notices that Jessica has changed a lot since their last meeting, especially her breasts. He decides that his priority now is Jessica, not Sarah. Director Nightingale gets into his cool, expensive car. Then she notices Michael in her back seat, who shouldn't be there. The guy casually starts the conversation, as if this is how everything was supposed to happen, completely ignoring the girl's reaction. She doesn't understand what the guy wants to achieve, and how he even ended up here. Michael sweetly announces his desire to go for a ride with Jessica, again ignoring her confusion. The girl embarrassedly asks if he was waiting for someone, but he reports that this is not that important at all. Slightly irritated, the heroine says that she cannot allow a stranger to sit in her car, and therefore he needs to introduce himself. Michael reports that he is ready to give his name, while simultaneously sensing darkness and a bloody trail from her soul, which foreshadow a big event, and then shyly gives his name. Downtown, a big beautiful building that every office clerk would love to be in. Jessica appears at the banquet with Michael, wearing a chic dress that emphasizes the girl's equally attractive figure. All eyes are on her. Everyone wants to know who she is and what kind of guy came with her. They sit down at a large banquet table, surrounded by whispers from those around them that the director has never brought a man over for the evening. Wealthy men immediately gather around her, wanting to get to know her better. Michael remains meaningfully silent while Jessica tries to keep the attention on herself. Everyone offers Mrs. Nightingale a drink, to which she becomes very embarrassed. Michael intercepts the glass intended for his companion, wondering how many glasses he needs to drink. Those who recently communicated so nicely with Jessica are greatly outraged by the intervention of some unknown beggar. Michael does not ignore the insults, smiling sarcastically. The director takes the glass from the guy, demonstrating his control over the situation. Jessica touchingly reports that she doesn't know how to drink wine, so she asks to be allowed to drink just one sip. This does not go unnoticed by her newly acquired fans. A man with a bottle of wine, standing out from the crowd with his charisma, appears and asks if one sip will not be enough. Jessica, straining greatly, recognizes him as Raphael Burke. Everyone around is gossiping about the influence of the young man and that the last time Nightingale threw a glass of wine on Burke, as a result of which he became madly angry. Raphael angrily reveals that Jessica must drink the whole bottle to atone for her past incident. He clearly makes it clear that this is not a request, but an order. The mistress tries to get out of it by insisting on one glass. Otherwise, she will cause trouble for others, remembering that she threw the glass on him that time because she thought it contained drugs. Raphael, approaching her at a dangerously close distance, reports that he has already booked the presidential suite, and therefore she will have a place to rest, and she should not break down. Jessica is afraid that there might also be drugs in there this time, so she doesn't dare to drink. The aggressor flares up in his displeasure, calling Jessica dirty names, hinting that even Sarah Walsh is drinking today. Sarah tearfully reflects on her situation, realizing that compared to his power, it means nothing. Michael bursts between the two people, taking Raphael's bottle away, leaving him in angry confusion. Burke curses dirty at the hero, for which he is instantly hit on the head with a bottle, causing it to shatter into pieces. The former abuser complains of a pain in his head like a small child. Michael responds to the complaints by saying that it is rude to force a girl to drink. Everyone is shocked by what just happened to such a highly respected person. Someone notices that the guy will not live to see tomorrow morning because he went against the Burke family, one of the most influential politicians in New York. Jessica begins to beg to spare her friend, promising to drink any wine in any quantity, understanding the consequences. In great rage, Raphael curses at the heroine and hits her in the face, informing her that the two of them will have big problems today. Burke continues to appear, but young Johnson interrupts him with a sharp kick to the balls. Raphael, crumpled on the floor in pain, swears that he will kill Michael, calling him a bastard. The main character flares up with hatred and hits the enemy's face on the floor, saying that he will still see which of them will die first. Many significant-looking men in black glasses appear, who look disapprovingly at what is happening and order to stop. The man standing in front with growing anger repeats twice that Michael must let his victim go. Onlookers report that this is the head of the Burke family and also the father of Raphael, and therefore Johnson is finished. 
Next to the head of the family stands a strange man with a long beard and an inscrutable gaze, who is most likely a legendary warrior. Jessica realizes that she and Michael are in huge trouble, and Raphael calls his daddy for help. Johnson releases the arrogant rich man with demonstrative indifference. In the past, the handsome and charismatic Raphael runs to his daddy like a little coward. The ancient warrior also has some kind of secret power like Michael, but does not express any emotions. Little Burke begs his father to punish his offender for taking Jessica from him. The father, furious, orders his pathetic son to shut up and get out of here, to which he is very surprised. The head of the family inquires about the origins of the young man from that same warrior named Jack Larson, addressing him personally while Burke's son hides behind him. Larson reports that Michael also has power, and due to his youth, it is easier for him to activate the power. The main character listens with feigned indifference and then wonders what else they have to say and what they generally want to achieve. The dishonored head of the family sets his warrior against Johnson, telling him to leave the body if he asks for mercy. The legendary warrior warns the hero that the guy should not have gotten involved with someone like him and begins his attack. Quickly approaching, the old man recommends that the young man beg for mercy. Michael indifferently responds to the enemy, and Jessica, in confusion, wonders whether this is really the same ancient warrior in front of her. Young Johnson, with complete indifference, grabs the old man by the top knot of his hair, wondering if the family has prepared a coffin for him. The old man experiences an indescribable range of emotions from the impudence of the boy. Jack Larson's eyes flash with blue flames, and he himself makes a sharp lunge towards his opponent, intending to deliver a crushing blow. Michael dodges the attack without any problems, leaving the warrior confused by his lack of control over the situation. The main character, using his advantage, delivers a crushing blow right to the face of the legendary warrior. From the power of Michael Johnson, the ancient warrior is finally and irrevocably defeated and slammed into the floor, and the main character complains about the old man's dishonorable attack. Everyone around is shocked by what they have just seen and is in a stupor from the shock they have suffered. Michael asks with absolute indifference who will be next. Father and son are shocked by how their legendary war was defeated with one blow. The old man wonders how the main character could have such power. Michael sarcastically discusses who he is. A strong sound wave emanates from Johnson, which does not go unnoticed by anyone present, including the great warrior Larson. Michael arrogantly approaches the head of the family without even taking his hands out of his pockets and addresses him by name. Using his power, the young hero intimidates the elder Burke, repeating the threats that were previously addressed to himself. Michael remembers that the Johnson and Burke families feuded for many years, even when the hero was not alive. Raphael's father orders his people to get rid of this insolent man. In the hope of increasing their salaries, the guards, as if in a race, are trying to be the first to get to the enemy. All the guards rush at Michael at the same time, but he calmly deals with them in an instant. The main character says that ordinary people obey and leave, looking around at their defeated rivals. Members of the Burke family humiliate themselves before Johnson and apologize in every possible way, begging him to leave them alive, and Michael mocks their helplessness. The hero's eyes flash with the red flame of revenge, and he says that the debts must be repaid. Just in time to ensure no one gets hurt, security rushes in and orders it to stop immediately. The chief officer, a pretty young girl in a tie and shirt with shoulder straps, asks Michael to move away from the people. Finding members of the Burke family on their knees, she wonders what her son has done again. Encouraged by the arrival of the security service, the father, joyful and relieved, says that they have been saved. Also, being in great shock from what she saw, she notices the defeated legendary warrior of the Burke family, who is dragging on his knees on the floor. Michael grabs the head of the family by the hair and says that he was just bravely defending a girl from a prosperous family from the advances of this guy. The officer aims a gun at the protagonist, ordering him to let go of Burke's hair or she will shoot. Meanwhile, Michael indifferently reflects on the fact that the captain turned out to be a woman. Young Johnson does not comply, which is why he receives a second warning and all the other armed people aim their weapons at him. Michael is going to deal with them too, again tapping into his inner strength. At this moment, Jessica grabs his hand, apologizes and says that the guy is not okay. He has cramps in his arms and legs. The lady invites the guy to stay here, to which he rightly asks why he needs this. The main characters argue, Jessica says that she will leave Johnson if he doesn't stop, to which he is indignant. At the same time, the head of the Burke family is worried about the state of his hair. Mistress Nightingale sits the guy down and tries to show the security captain that he's surrendering so they don't have to shoot. Michael is very upset that he was not allowed to deal with the security service, so he asks what to do next, and Jessica asks that this be left to her. 
The director tells Johnson that he will have to travel with the captain, fill out a statement that he defended himself, then everything will be fine. He replies that he will be able to leave without any problems. It's already late at night. There is peace and quiet in the city. The sky is clear. The stars and the police department are clearly visible. Another police officer comes into the office of Captain Jenkins, who was at the crime scene, and reports that they have watched the video footage more than 10 times. The subordinate reports that all cameras show that Michael Johnson acted in self-defense, with the exception of one. The girl asks what he means by doubts in one cell, to which he shows her the recording. The cameras show that at first the old man approaches the guy, but in the next frame he is already lying on the floor, and what happened at that moment is unknown. The captain reasons that despite their quick reaction, someone could have managed to erase the data from the CCTV camera. Despite the fact that he may have enormous power hidden within him, there is no evidence against Johnson, and therefore they recognize it only as self-defense and let him go. A satisfied Jessica and an indifferent Michael leave the police station into a clear night. The girl is glad that they got off easy. The young hero realizes that if he leaves New York, the Burks will get their dirty paws on her again. Michael decides that he needs to find time to deal with them. They walk through the city at night, having a nice conversation. The guy offers to walk her home. Jessica begins to get nervous. Johnson reports that he just arrived in the city and has not yet found a place to stay for the night, and therefore he will apparently have to spend the night on a bench in the park, to which the girl replies that she has a free room in her apartment that she can allocate for Michael. Johnson begins to make vulgar jokes towards Mrs. Nightingale, which makes her very embarrassed. They continue their casual conversation, not noticing the car parked nearby. In this car is Captain Jenkins, already familiar to us, who is watching the couple, talking about Michael's strength, since all the bodyguards of the Burke family are former special forces. After reasoning, she calls her brother and sends the CCTV footage in the hope that he will help figure it out. The mountains are at the level of the clouds. A lonely house with a pair of windows and an orange triangular roof has been built here. Captain Jenkins' brother, who has solid muscles, a scar on his face and a bunch of weapons on his back, complains about his sister since she always asks for his help. He is outraged by the current situation because he is the captain of the Dragon Spirit Squad and not a movie policeman, but he still undertakes to help his sister and pulls the laptop with his power. Brother Jenkins turns on the device and begins watching the video sent by his sister. Smiling maliciously, he's indignant at the inability of the bodyguards to resist such a child. They should be fired. This is a disgrace. The Dragon Spirit captain notices a shot of Michael dispatching opponents without even touching them, realizing that he has the power. He says that skill is the peak of opportunity, and Johnson is a true martial artist. Brother Jenkins calls her and says that he would really like to know more about this guy in the video as soon as possible. There is a growing crescent moon in the sky. There is light cloudiness, a panel house in which the lights are on, and Jessica lives there. Mrs. Nightingale comes out of the bathroom and says that it is now free, and Michael can go there. Standing under hot water in the shower, doused with steam, he again begins to remember his past. After being saved from death, he thought it was a blessing, but an even worse nightmare began. On the very first day, without any explanation, the master threw him into a cage with a tiger that had been starving for three days. But in the end, Michael survived and defeated the tiger, but this was only the beginning of his trials. The master sent him to dangerous places, tempering his body and soul. Each time he faced hopeless situations, and each time he survived, so he feels alive only when he is constantly in anger and hatred. The last Johnson swears that he will find all those who were at that ill-fated banquet, and they will pay for everything in full. Meanwhile, Jessica is slicing a watermelon, thinking about how Michael has nothing to change into, and remembering that she forgot to hide her underwear. In a panic, she runs to pick up what she left in the hope that the guy has not yet seen anything. The girl runs into the shower, asks Michael not to leave, but notices that he has already left and is standing in front of her, covering himself with a towel. In front of him, she cannot say what she wanted and begins to stutter, but he cannot understand what she wants, asks to wait while he gets dressed and pulls off the towel. She runs away, slamming the door behind her, leaving the guy very bewildered. A very embarrassed Jessica is in her room trying to prove that she didn't see anything unnecessary. Michael understands that she won't come out anymore, but that's good, because he still needs to settle some things. It's late at night in the Burke family's luxurious villa with a swimming pool and the lights on in the room. The father grinds his teeth from public humiliation. The son tells his father to stop shaking with hatred as it makes him dizzy. Dad is very indignant. He shouts that because of his useless son, the legendary warrior Jack Larson is seriously injured. 
and only his grandfather can protect the family instead. The son, sobbing, offers to call his grandfather, since he still does nothing, and the father says that he cannot leave it like this, so he will not calm down until he deals with that guy. Together they decide to call the elder Burke, and Raphael imagines how he will mock Michael, undressing Jessica in front of him. During the conversation, a dark figure appears, suspiciously reminiscent of Johnson, who wonders what they are talking about. The members of the Burke family present are in indescribable shock at the appearance of their newfound worst enemy. Michael sits casually on a chair and invites them to chat, while the others are afraid that he will kill them. The Burkles do not believe that he is capable of killing, but the protagonist begins to use his power against them, directing his supernatural power against his son. The father begins to tearfully beg Johnson to let him live, explaining that he has no claims against him, to which Michael just laughs madly, sarcastically questioningly repeating the phrase about claims. The guy angrily reminds the father of the Burke family that five years ago there was a banquet at which all the Johnsons were killed. Berkeley suddenly begins to realize that his opponent is the same boy who fell into the lake and is surprised that he still survived. Michael slams his hand full of magical power into Berkeley Sr.'s face. The last Johnson before killing Burke Sr. says that he is not an ancient warrior at all, but a god of medicine, and then laughs at his idea that a warrior is the peak of his capabilities. Michael uses his magic to deal with the man and shouts that he will deal with anyone blow. On this day, New York shook. Claude Burke, the eldest of the Burks, materializes above the mountain in extreme dissatisfaction. He is dressed in a kimono. Magical energy flows around him. He sees the death of his relatives, but does not know who dared to do it. The old man swears that he will find the one who did this, behead him, and chop him into thousands of pieces. At Jessica's apartment, Michael meditates in the company of his power spirit and muses about how he needs to train more while being there. Johnson is holding a black stone in his hands, a gift from his father for the boy's tenth birthday. He still doesn't know what to do with it, and in a week the day of his parents' death will come, and therefore he will need to visit them. The guy notices a strange inscription in red on the stone, he suggests that blood should be dripped onto it. The stone jumps out of the hero's hands. The artifact begins to spread large waves of energy around itself, pressing on Michael, which makes his head spin. He won't last long. The young hero appears at the cemetery beaten and half-naked, surrounded only by a clear night, swords stuck in the ground, and tombstones. Michael comes to his senses, his head is pounding, and he notices a black fog around him. He ended up in the cemetery of rebirth and does not understand what is happening there and how he ended up there. Magic swords glowing with violet fire from the sky begin to fall on him. Among the swords, red eyes with vague outlines of mouth appear. They seem to have bad intentions. Roth angrily says that being in the late stage of life, the hero dared to enter the rebirth cemetery. Multiple dark spirits order the guy to leave immediately if he wants to live. Michael wakes up on the bed in a cold sweat with a black stone in his hand and a sore head. He remembers last night and that his strength has not yet reached the threshold of entering the rebirth cemetery. There are exactly 100 tombstones, therefore 100 souls. A knock on the door interrupts his thoughts. It is Jessica who informs him that breakfast is ready and she is waiting for him. Finishing his reasoning, the guy goes out and sits down at the table where Mrs. Nightingale is already there and a rich, delicious breakfast. Michael turns to Jessica that she cares about him so much that he doesn't want to leave and offers to wash the dishes, cook on his own and warm his bed on cold winter nights. She notices that she has heated floors in winter and if he wants to stay, it's not possible since she has monthly rent and household chores. The guy embarrassedly says that he doesn't have money now. Jessica suspects that he decided to live at her expense. Young Johnson grabs a napkin, begins to write something intensely on it, and then hands her a piece of paper with some kind of recipe. This rejuvenating product of one of my friends is considered low grade, but if you register it, then rent will not be a problem. Jessica laughs at his proposal and says that no company in the market would be interested in his proposal. Michael imagines the complete success of the product in his head. Then the director's phone rings. It turns out to be Sarah Walsh. Jessica takes off and runs to the meeting, leaving the guy alone in confusion, recommending that he find a job rather than think about the elixir. The central market, where Michael is trying to sell his miraculous remedy, Miracle Hands, which cures all diseases, passes by notice the extravagant price of 100,000. And they clearly do not intend to buy this product for that kind of money considering the guy a madman and a charlatan. Suddenly, a pretty girl in a beret and a pink windbreaker appears in the crowd. She calls the seller to her, jokingly calling him a charlatan. Michael leaves with the girl. Upon arrival, they see a large, beautiful house. The guy again advertises his medicine, but the girl explains that this is not what she brought him here for. 
she introduces herself as Anna Clark and says that she is extremely captivated by his desire to outwit everyone, to which Michael says that he has no time for games and then tries to leave. After that, she gives a card, the balance of which is the promised 100,000, and the main character changes his position and says that he is all at her disposal and will go through fire and water for her. Anna tells a sad story about her family and about the illness of her father, who only has a couple of days left to live, and she is also afraid that after his death, her mother will do something stupid. She asks Michael to take his father to the mountains for pretend treatment to make it easier for his mother to bear his loss, and the guy notices that this miss is not very smart. Finding a benefit for himself, the hero promises to do everything in the best possible way. They enter the house and are greeted by the doctor, noting that now is not the right time to receive guests, since her father Robert Clark is ill. The guy and the girl enter the chambers, finding the older Clark looking sick. The girl tells her father that she has returned again. Michael realizes that things are very bad. He sees that this man will soon leave for another world, since his chest is already filled with dead air, and when it reaches his head, nothing will help him. The daughter also sees her father's condition and tells Michael that they have been undergoing treatment for a long time, but not a single doctor could help him. And the latter said that dad had one day to live. She asks the guy to help hide this fact from her mother at any cost. Then the mother comes into the room and asks if it is true that the father has one day to live, as the doctor told her. Some guy remarks that there is no point in hiding this information from his mother. He introduces himself as Percy Clark, Anna's brother, and says that he has already organized the funeral, which will take place in a picturesque place. The daughter complains about the indifference and callousness of her brother, with which he says this in front of his mother, but he says that his father has already suffered enough, and when Percy himself becomes the head of the family, he will not offend anyone. Michael understands that if his mother is gone, then there will be even more money for Percy, and Anna says that his father will never allow him to become the head of the family, telling his brother that he is just an animal. Percy curses his sister dirty, threatens her cruelly and raises his hand to her. Michael defends the girl, attacking her brother, saying that her father is not dead yet, but this one has already planned everything. The doctor intervenes and states that the main character has just hit the future head of the Clark house and wonders who he even is. The god of medicine asks for a price of 10 million and promises to heal the father of the family. The mother asks her daughter whether that guy can really help her father, to which the girl lies saying that she has known him for a very long time and is completely confident in him. Anna reasons that he simply has to cure Dad because he charged an incredible price for his services. Percy is clearly not happy with the intervention of some charlatan sent by his sister and feels from him a danger to himself and his plans. He does not care what happens next. The main thing is that he will definitely receive an inheritance. Michael approaches the bed of the father of the Clark family. There is no one else in the room. The guy decides that he will not let him die, since they have already met. Particles of his power begin to appear around him. He reports that the knowledge he has acquired about medicine should be enough to pull the old man out of the ghostly gates. Michael's eyes glow pinkish purple and he recites a spell. Robert, to the loud exclamation of the guy who shouts get up, rises into the air. Black energy begins to come out of his eyes and mouth along with dark smoke. Michael realizes that this battle will be much more difficult than he expected since the man is enveloped in the energy of death. But the old man still has a pulse, and therefore all is not lost. Michael continues to fight with the dark force of death for the body of the father of the family. The dead spirit escapes from the man's body, and Michael catches it in his fist. The remnants of the dark essence forcefully splash out from the old man's body, heading into Michael's fist. Exhausted but alive, the old man falls onto his bed, and Michael argues that saving him was harder than killing any of his previous opponents. The god of medicine goes out the door to his waiting relatives and reports that everything is fine with their head of the family and he will wake up soon. Percy can't believe his ears and the fact that his plans will go to waste. Anna doesn't understand whether her new acquaintance is deceiving them and her mother cries from her newfound happiness. Michael asks to pay him. The enthusiastic wife of the reborn thanks him and gives him a card, telling him the password for it. But Percy, clearly dissatisfied with this set of circumstances, intervenes and brings his mother down to earth, reminding him that his father has an advanced stage of lung cancer and it is not possible to cure him. Percy sticks his finger in the supposed charlatan's face, insisting that he must see the results first, to which the medicine god replies that it wasn't that easy for him to earn that money and grabs his finger. The next moment, Percy is already writhing on the floor in pain and Michael says that he took the money as if for a consultation 
and the master will wake up for three days, and after that they can turn to him again. And if they don't come, then death for their relative is already guaranteed. Percy, enraged, vows to finish Michael off, and the doctor tries to calm him down and says that he will help him sort everything out. Then, unexpectedly for everyone, Robert comes out to the family. The son is in incredible shock from what he sees, and mother and daughter are sincerely happy to see him. With his first words, the father asks where the doctor who saved his life has gone. The head of the clerks thanks his wife and daughter for calling such a wonderful doctor for him, and sarcastically remarks to his son that he has done a lot of good things lately. The father angrily attacks his son, knowing full well what he really planned, and that Percy will never see his father's money again unless he finds the doctor who saved his life again. At the same time, a meeting of directors is taking place at the Apple office, where it is reported that shares are falling and the company is in a difficult situation and that the forecast will not change in the near future. Everyone is discussing that they need to launch a new line of cosmetics to avoid bankruptcy. Jessica sits in complete confusion, remembering Michael's recent dubious proposal. She's all nervous. Her chest itches. She tries to do something about it and finds Johnson's note. The paper contains a recipe for the very elixir that the young man was talking about. While Jessica is talking about how something like this can cost 10 million, a girl with glasses comes up behind her and snatches the piece of paper from her hands. Carmen wonders what the headmistress is hiding in her underwear and then wonders what the recipe is. The girls begin to argue over the piece of paper since Carmen does not want to give it back and mocks Jessica, hinting that she got the recipe through the bed, to which the heroine hints that not everyone is like her. The rival ignores Mrs. Nightingale's requests and tears the paper in front of her eyes. Jessica is incredibly angry and cannot say a word out of anger and then pushes Carmen, shouting that it was her piece of paper. The others, noticing this altercation, completely ignore what is happening, since this is not the first time this has happened. The girls swear and angrily grab each other by the hair, swearing over the just destroyed piece of paper, and Carmen also insults Jessica, and she threatens to tear her painted face like that note. Some seemingly bossy woman appears and tells the girls to stop quarreling immediately. Apple president Sarah Walsh fully enters the room, her eyes glowing, and the flames of her employees' fear of her person blazing behind her. Everyone calms down and the meeting begins. Everyone present listens carefully to the president's speech. She is very unhappy with the research and development department because their products remain the same for many years. Workers try to justify themselves by complaining about high competition and the fact that they have already searched through all the known recipes, but this does not help improve the effects of cosmetics. Sarah thinks in her head that it took her a long time to build her biggest cosmetics company, and therefore she can't give up so easily. Carmen sarcastically remarks that Jessica had some kind of recipe from a famous person. Everyone gets inspired when they hear the name of this person, wondering if she really has something like that. She reports that this is not entirely true because this recipe was written by her friend. Jessica frantically shows the torn piece of paper, trying to say that her friend was just trying to make a joke. Everyone around is disappointed with the priceless formula written on a napkin, and Carmen is happy that she was able to humiliate her rival by making her look like a fool. Then one of the employees of the research and development department notices that the recipe is true, despite everything. All the hatred of those gathered was directed at Carmen, since everyone saw that she was tearing this napkin to annoy Jessica. Sarah promises to fire the culprit, and if the recipe is not restored, then to prosecute her. Carmen begs for mercy, noting that she did not do this on purpose. The employee reports that with this formula, they will be able to make a real breakthrough in the industry, surpassing their competitors. The president is extremely inspired by the information received and orders an immediate search for the pieces and restoration of the elixir recipe. Carmen is shocked that Jessica had the same recipe, and she also helped introduce it, so she freezes on the spot, and Sarah tells her to go to the shopping department. They will look after her. The director returns home and calls Michael, but he seems to have already left. Jessica sits on the sofa in thought and wonders whether her new friend who wrote that very recipe will return. Michael amazes the girl with his actions, because in fact he is a stranger who spent the night with her and wrote the right recipe. She even begins to think that he is the hidden ruler of the world. Someone's hand falls on her head. She begins to scream in horror, covered in cold sweat. And behind her is a guy whom the heroine was thinking about just recently, who asks why she called him and how she is doing. Jessica asks when he managed to return. The guy says that he had just heard her call. They talk. The girl is incredibly embarrassed. She asks to write the recipe for the elixir for her again, since the previous formula was spoiled. Michael reports that the recipe is not that good yet, 
It's just a note. The guy offers to write another recipe. The guy is about to go to bed and therefore says that Jessica should also go to bed early today, but she tries to continue the conversation, grabbing his hand. Michael jokes that he is ready to listen to her if she asks him as a man, to which the girl says that she can still call the police. Jessica turns the conversation to the topic of his search for Sarah Walsh and says that she herself wants to see him. The guy with a dissatisfied face repeats Sarah Walsh's name and says that he won't go to her, he can't, he's busy. The girl tries to remind him that he went through a lot to get to her, and now he himself is resisting. He quips that yesterday his love was ignored, so today it's his turn to be hard to touch. Michael insists that Mrs. Walsh call him herself tomorrow, since he is not in the mood to go to her, after which he ends the conversation and goes to bed. Then Jessica's phone rings. It turns out to be her boss, who is interested in what she was able to get from Michael. Sarah says she'll think about contacting him herself, but for now let the director keep an eye on the guy. The president, having hung up the phone, talks about what an unusual young man she came across, who first makes a scene in the office, and then does not dare to come. The next morning, Michael enters the Temple of Humanity, pondering the strange appearance for the pharmacy. Michael notices a long line at the pharmacy, so he decides that he needs to look around first at the largest pharmacy he has ever seen. Michael stops next to a huge painting, which he really likes, even though he understands that it is just a fake. Michael notices that someone behind him asks where this beetle came from, turns around and sees in front of him Lily and Jacob Sanders, who are grandfather and granddaughter. The girl is indignant that the guy called their family's treasure a fake, noting that she doesn't may be so since it was bought in the capital. Jacob delicately notes that several collectors have noticed the authenticity of the image, to which Johnson replies that this only proves that they and the collectors are uneducated. He notices the flaw, but dismissively says that the copy is very good, and therefore they can continue to deceive people, and then sadly remarks that he expected to find something worthwhile here. The granddaughter begins to glow with magical turquoise energy, and the grandfather tries to stop her, reminding her that this is a simple person. She can't let that bastard be so arrogant and prepares a magical strike, swinging her leg at him. Grandfather shouts that ancient martial arts cannot be used against mere mortals. Michael, without much difficulty, grabs the girl by the leg with which she wanted to inflict a magical blow, disdainfully wondering if this is really all she is capable of. Lily in her head is shocked that the guy so easily defended himself from her technique, with which she easily knocks out two bags of sand. The main character asks if she has calmed down and begins to tickle her recently captured leg. The tickling makes the girl lose concentration and falls to the floor, leaving her grandfather shocked by what is happening. Michael jokes and laughs at the girl's abilities but says that a couple more years of training could fix everything. Lily Sanders screams in rage at her attacker, who remains completely indifferent. The adult notices that he coped with her reception without any problems, and therefore only with his mercy, she is still healthy, and she complains that he simply pissed her off, so she would have easily won. Michael hints that he can repeat it at full strength by showing her terrifying form behind him. The girl wants to run away. The grandfather apologizes for her behavior, and also orders his granddaughter to apologize. After this, the old man asks Michael to tell him more about this picture, since he is already too old for such riddles. Michael, using his superpower, shows the old man why he said that the painting is a fake, and also reports that sometimes it is very difficult to distinguish a fake from the original. Besides, the author of this work tried very hard, and not for a small amount. After the story, the hero receives medicine from the hands of Lilia Sanders herself, the granddaughter of the chief physician. Michael offends the girl, to which she flares up again and declares that today is simply not her day, and in general her grandfather interrupted her. Jacob puts the girl in her place, saying that even her master cannot learn the powers that the guy standing in front of them has. Michael orders more medicine. They say they will do it for free for the inconvenience, but the guy insists on paying. Johnson says that he has enough money to pay, and the girl makes faces at him in order to somehow offend him. Jacob tries to explain to his granddaughter that this warrior is from a famous family, and if it's really him, then the city will be uneasy in the near future. Michael walks through the city and remembers his plan for revenge, and that it is time to prepare for it. But first he realizes that he needs to deal with the annoying fly, meaning the suspicious guy behind him. Meanwhile, in the pharmacy, the argument continues about who this guy was here just now. The girl does not believe that he is special, and the grandfather says that he is, however, stronger than her master. There are rumors that he can destroy entire troops with his bare hands. All weapons are powerless against him, and people are just ants to him. The girl says that he is too young, but Grandfather continues that he is not even a master. 
but something more powerful. You can't give him more than 20, and he already has so many opponents, so we shouldn't become one of them. The Clark family messenger is happy to have found the one he was ordered to find so quickly. Michael turned into an alley. The guy thinks that he was noticed, but it turns out that his target has completely disappeared. The guy is still confused, but Johnson is already diving on top of him using his magical power. The servant finds himself under Michael. The young hero tells the servant not to force him to kill. The pursuer asks for mercy, promising to tell everything he knows. The guy turns out to be a private detective and tells everything about himself, his family, profession, hobbies, complains about living conditions, says that he took out a loan. Michael explodes and shouts that he needs the name of the customer and not all the nonsense he just heard. The detective says that the father of the Clark family is looking for him everywhere and has offered a reward of one million for his capture. Michael remembers about the untreated old man. The detective simultaneously offers a lucrative offer, asking him to go with him to the customer. The hero leaves indifferently, recommending the guy not to do this kind of thing again if he wants to live. The character returns to the house and notices a very nicely dressed Jessica there, who is getting ready to go somewhere. She tells Michael that they are going shopping together to get new clothes for him and a phone to keep in touch. He says that she shouldn't spend so much money on him, and Jessica tells him not to worry about it, taking his arm and heading to the store. Michael is standing in his new dress suit. It suits him very well, perfectly complimenting his appearance. Jessica embarrassedly remarks that he looks very attractive in this suit. She, winking, says that in this form it's not even a shame to pick up students, and also wonders if he has anyone, and talks about her friend's older sister as a real beauty, to which the hero sharply replies that he doesn't have one. There will never be a girl. The girl suspects that Michael has never fallen in love, and that he is generally a virgin, but he remembers in his head that he clearly had no time for that. For five years he honed his skills, and therefore he had no time or desire to communicate with girls. But once upon a time, when his family was still alive, he liked Lucy Vox, who was the most beautiful in school. He even wrote her a love letter, which she replied to. The answer was a request to admit this in front of everyone at the line at school, which he did in his naivety, and she blew him off in front of everyone. It was a trap, and he fell for it. Then he realized that girls are a waste of time and resources and not worth it. The guy is burning with rage, and the girl tells him not to worry so much, because she didn't have anyone either, but life is still wonderful. They go to another store, talking peacefully, and on the way they meet Maria, a friend of Michael's first love. Dahlberg ignores the hero, turning only to Jessica, noting that she has not changed at all and seems to have a boyfriend. Then she notices that he looks suspiciously like Michael Johnson. Next, she tells her friend the story that the hero recently recalled. After searching the internet, they find out that the victim of their dispute has already died along with his entire family. Michael flares up and wants to shut up the stupid old acquaintance along with her vile boyfriend. Jessica notices the guy's condition, grabs his hand and tells him not to pay attention to them, and takes him further to the shops. Insults fly in the back. Michael says that he could get rid of them without any problems, to which Jessica gently hints that the guy was already at the station a couple of days ago. They notice a very cool suit that would be great for Michael. The consultant notices them and says that they made a great choice, and the price is only 360000 Jessica realizes that she doesn't have enough money on her card, so she tries to pretend that the suit doesn't suit him at all. Maria Dahlberg appears again and speaks, insulting Mrs. Walsh, to which she tries to justify herself. Jessica is very angry and wants to hit her friend, but she threatens with her connections and says that there will be consequences. Michael can't hold back his emotions and gives this pathetic woman a juicy slap, telling her that she'd better shut her mouth forever. Everyone is shocked by this act. Jessica is surprised. An old friend is surprised that she was hit. Her boyfriend is very confused. The bitch's boyfriend threatens with his status, simultaneously performing some actions on the phone, saying that such poor people as they can only dream of money like his. In the midst of an argument, Percy appears with his father, who are confused by what they saw in the store. He wonders how someone dared threaten the god of medicine using his own company's name. The boyfriend cannot believe his eyes. He sees in front of him the president of the company, who should now be seriously ill. A girl and a rich guy bow to the power of the father of the Clark family. The president ignores the clinging, heading straight to his savior, thanking him for saving his life in sincere gratitude. Everyone around is shocked by the relationship between the rich man and Michael, especially Jessica, who thought that her friend had no power. Michael disappointingly reports that unfortunately, most of his family is not happy to learn that he survived. But the master says that his son is ready to improve 
and orders him to kneel before Johnson. The guy, sitting on his knees, apologizes for the inconvenience caused to the god of medicine. Those familiar with Percy are shocked by his behavior because he has always been very proud and incapable of such things. Michael pointedly ignores everyone around him and turns to Jessica, saying that it's time for them to go to some women's clothing store to buy her something too. The father punishes his son, believing that Michael's neglect is caused by his behavior and also informs him that if he never earns forgiveness, he will spend the rest of his life on his knees. The bitch's boyfriend notices that the president of the company made a mistake about something, to which he slaps the slanderer in the face and says that he and his father no longer work there. Maria Dahlberg notices that they crossed the path of the wrong person, and her boyfriend is crying because he has nothing more, and now he is the rogue here. Jessica and Michael leave the store with a bag of clothes. The girl happily reports that the guy couldn't pay the rent, but allows himself to buy clothes for her. Mrs. Nightingale is very touched by Johnson's behavior, and he knows that she took pity on him, buying only goods at a discount. Although everyone understands that he has millions in his hands, she really is a good girl. Already on the street, the clerk's father, Robert, catches up with them. He asks the young people to wait for him. With a helpful face, he invites them to take a walk. Behind him are two of his employees with their arms full of boxes with expensive brands. Michael asks what he needs, and the head of the clerk says that he does not need Johnson. But the girl next to him, he says that he has gifts for her and hands over everything that his servants had behind his back. Jessica realizes that these are the things she wanted to buy, but for which she did not have enough money. Johnson understands that Robert is not a mistake, and therefore decided to come from the side of a girl who is easier to please. Michael notices his interest in saving his life, and therefore says that he will come to them tomorrow at nine o'clock in the morning, giving him one last chance. Robert is very happy that Johnson paid attention to him, and reports that he and his company are always ready to provide him with any help. An unknown mansion, in which Dahlberg tries to prove to Lucy Vox that she saw Michael Josnan, who has not changed at all in appearance, but his character has undergone major changes. The girl is very interested in the words spoken by her friend, so she listens very carefully to the detailed story about the guy's adventures. Lucy notes that a young man must have very great status and power for Robert Clark to crucify himself in front of him. And if Michael had survived, he would have been homeless, so this whole situation is simply unthinkable. The girl reflects that five years ago, the Johnson family was weaker than the Vox family, so even if he survived, the situation cannot be equal to hers. The couple gets to Jessica's house. She is very interested in how Johnson knows Robert Clark, because she could only dream of buying such expensive things. Interrupting her enthusiastic thoughts, the girl remembers work and wonders if Michael will meet with the president of her company. Jessica teases the main character, but he calmly parries her attack and sits down to watch TV. It is reported on television that two male bodies were found in the same mansion. The report said that the dead were Raphael Burke and his stern father. The police confirmed that it was a brutal and premeditated murder. Jessica, horrified, says that of course she would like to take revenge on them, but obviously not in such a harsh way. Michael reports that bad people tend to make enemies for themselves, and therefore this is a common occurrence, and also indifferently says that this is his doing. Mrs. Nightingale does not believe that her friend could do this, because being able to fight well is not the same as being able to kill. She rejects the guy's words, changes the subject, and goes in a cheerful mood to try on new things that she has just purchased. Michael goes for a walk through the quiet city at night, talks about the medications he has purchased, and realizes that now he has everything he needs to train his skills. During his thoughts, he meets Captain Jenkins, who is already familiar to him, and she is glad that they have finally met again. The hero remembers who it is and says that he is busy now and is trying to leave. The officer, as if to the point, asks if the guy has heard about what happened to the Burke family, even if she doesn't believe that it could be him. But the Johnson family has gone into oblivion. Michael interrupts her by grabbing her by the neck, sparkling with his power, and asking what she is hinting at. A frightened Jenkins realizes that despite her martial arts training, she can't handle the guy, and also says that there are still some things they need to discuss, but she wanted to do it over dinner. He refuses and leaves, saying that he has other plans for this time and the girl is trying to catch her breath after the capture. She argues that the guy has achieved perfection in ancient martial arts, but even in five years, it is impossible to achieve such a result. What happened to him during this time? Michael is standing in the kitchen of Jessica's apartment, chopping ingredients for something. He plans to use Nightingale's microwave while she sleeps to practice alchemy. Something goes wrong, and the guy realizes that the ingredients the doctor gave him have already gone bad. But at the same time, 
he still manages to create at least five red spheres, although he should have gotten much more. But this should be enough. In the morning, Jessica wakes up from some noise and goes sleepy into the living room, yawning heavily. In the hallway, she discovers Michael, who is intensively getting ready for something. He says that he is going for an examination, and if necessary, he will gladly accept her call. She says that she wouldn't call him a doctor because he talks nonsense all day long, and argues that he knew the recipe, and therefore can be able to heal. Then she remembers the incident that happened with the Johnson family. She doesn't understand why trouble befell such a good family. Each member was as kind as possible. Anna is standing somewhere in the middle of the city and seems to be actively waiting for someone. Some guys are thinking about who such a beauty might be waiting for, a friend or a boyfriend. One of them says that a rich girl can't wait for a guy like that. She can only drive around in an expensive car with a security guard. The second agrees that there is something in this meaning. A third appears and says that she is clearly not waiting for one of them, but they are intrigued by his words. Michael says that he doesn't understand women, but this girl is clearly waiting for him and not anyone else. The guys begin to mock Johnson, since a beauty with such a luxurious car cannot wait for a freak like him. But at that moment, Anna notices him and calls the main character. Anna runs up to Michael and is genuinely happy to see him, leaving the other two guys confused. She brings the hero to her home in a luxurious living room, where Robert Clark and his wife are already waiting for them. Michael hands over five already blackened balls, and the patient wonders if this can really be eaten and asks if there is any alternative, such as acupuncture or a decoction. The hero says that you need to eat all five of them at once. Robert obeys and throws them into his mouth. The father of the family immediately flares up with magical energy, shocking those around him. Robert feels full of strength and energy under the influence of a large number of medicinal herbs. The completely revived head of the family almost flies into the sky with joy. His relatives think that he fed him stimulants. Robert says that he will be grateful to Dr. Johnson all his life, giving him $100 million for his help. Michael says that this is just a deal and there is no need to exalt him too high. The restless father of the family reports that he has an empty property and gives the key card to Michael for use and also hopes that the doctor will have time to have dinner together. Michael thinks that he can store his medicine in the empty apartment and Clark himself can be useful to him because he understands business and therefore he can help with the company taken away from the Johnsons. The hero happily accepts the key card and makes an appointment for dinner tomorrow evening, and Robert agrees. The young god of medicine says goodbye and silently leaves the Clark house to go about his business. Michael stands next to a huge pile of medicines that the eldest of a dynasty of doctors has prepared for him. The recipient is satisfied with the quality of resources for his work and thinks that these doctors are successfully maintaining the bar. The seller sets the price at five million because he remembers that Johnson will not accept the goods for free but Michael understands that the price of the goods is at least twice as much. The main character wonders where his granddaughter went, and having received the answer that she went to the mountains with the master, Michael gives the old man an incomprehensible piece of paper for his granddaughter and tells him to give it to the master if she doesn't understand what it is for. Michael asks where alchemical supplies can be purchased in New York, and the old man wonders how this young gentleman even knows about alchemy. The pharmacist notices that the alchemists disappeared thousands of years ago. There are only a couple of pills left on the market, but they are priceless. It used to be that a family with an alchemist could become one of the leading families in just three years. The old man is shocked by Johnson's capabilities, but he jokes that he doesn't understand anything about alchemy. He just likes the appearance of alchemical furnaces. Having received the answer that the stove will be available at auction in five days, Michael asks to contact him and leaves. Then Lilia Sanders unexpectedly returns with her master and shouts to her grandfather that they have returned. First, the grandfather asks whether his granddaughter behaved well, and then he talks about how Michael Johnson was here again, and she offended him last time, and this time she ran away. The girl insists that his master is cooler, and the teacher himself tells the girl not to say anything stupid because her grandfather does not say meaningless speeches. Jacob reports that Johnson left something for her and hands over the piece of paper, the granddaughter, of course, cannot understand what is written there. She throws away the paper, saying that everything is written there in terrible handwriting. The note ends up with the master, and he wonders if her grandfather mixed up something, and whether it's really for Lilia. The master determines that this note is from a real professional, and very nervously asks Jacob to meet this young man. The teacher says that even in his youth he trained, and his strength was of astronomical proportions. After a long time he noticed that something even touched his internal organs. 
The girl says that this explains the discomfort she feels after training. The master reassures the girl that there is nothing wrong with this because he is watching her so that nothing happens. He says that if he continues to train himself, he will die, but Johnson wrote on this piece of paper a salvation that will help him become even stronger. The girl thinks that even if the master calls this guy a noble man, she doesn't understand who he really should be. Michael stands near a huge villa and realizes that this is exactly what Robert Clark has prepared for him, and not some luxury room that he was counting on. The guy didn't think it would be so big. He is simply delighted with the apartment provided to him and praises the furniture and notices that he likes Robert more and more. The guy thinks that it's somehow lonely here for one person, and therefore he's going to invite Jessica here too. At the same time, Jessica calls Johnson to say that she needs to return home to her parents for a while, so they will not meet in the evening, and Michael is a little worried about her. The hero argues that his house used to be smaller, but it always had a harmonious and lively atmosphere. Michael remembers that tomorrow is the anniversary of his parents' death. He promises to avenge them. He has already managed to get out of the whirlpool, which means revenge is just around the corner. Michael hears the doorbell ring and goes out to take the large quantities of medications brought to him, noting that he can easily fit all his purchases in this building. The elder Sanders personally calls him, along with his granddaughter and the master, informing him that they are ready to help him at any time if anything else is needed. Here Michael draws attention to the ancient warrior who came with them, and he greets him and bows slightly. Michael politely invites them to his new mansion, wondering who this great warrior is. He falls to his knees and introduces himself as Jason Reynolds and thanks him for saving his life. Lilia is shocked that her master fell on his face in front of the guy. The master calls him a benefactor and a great master, to which Johnson wonders why they call him that and scratches his head. Reynolds is very surprised, thinking that he is even stronger than the great master, since this is the basic knowledge that everyone has. Michael pretends that he is a beginner and does not understand the classification of martial arts ranks that is accepted here. The master is glad that he can teach such a warrior something and enthusiastically tells that there are four levels, external force, internal force, master of half transformation and master of transformation. Jason tells Michael that he is at the highest level and belongs to the class of transformation masters and countless martial artists look up to him. The idea pops up in the head of the main character that his strength is an order of magnitude higher than those classifications that are accepted in New York, which goes without saying. Remembering the correct classification, Michael understands that he is approximately on the same level with the strongest current masters in America, although he is still very far from the true peak. Johnson believes that he underestimated the masters and therefore asks Reynolds about how many of them there are and discusses whether there might be someone stronger than him nearby. Jason reveals that he does not know the exact number, but he knows that most of them are somehow connected to the Hodges family, and also says that despite the current era of technology and progress, those who truly control their rights know about martial arts. Jacob says there are four main families in New York, and the fourth of them is the Burke family. It's a pity that they were recently killed, but their old man is a master who secretly practiced the arts. Michael recalls that just before his death, Raphael's father threatened him with violence from the eldest in the family, calling him a strong master. Among the rest of the families, Lucy Vox made the most impression. If not for her humiliation, he would not have received the brand of a worthless person. He declares to himself that he will soon deal with her, showing who the real non-entity is here. Reynolds, from the outside, senses a strong aura of hatred surrounding Johnson and wonders how much blood Michael has on his hands at such and such an age. The main character walks through the evening city, cheerful crowds of people milling around, busy with their evening rest, and he talks about the fact that Jessica does not answer his calls and is afraid that something has happened to her. Michael's stomach insists that they need to find some place to eat. He walks into his old friend's diner, remembering the past that united them and how the food was always very tasty there, and even when he was deeply depressed, his friend was always there. But it turns out that there is no one in the stall, but Michael still decides to order something. Michael asks to bring him a branded kebab and a bottle of something, but is refused, since the owner is already closing the stall and recommends that he eat elsewhere. A woman familiar to Michael says that tomorrow they are moving to a new place where he can visit them. The hero is sincerely surprised that they are changing place after so much time and is wary at the sight of an abrasion on the face of a friend. A man appears out of nowhere and brings the order to the young man, saying that there is no need to drive away the guests. The guy also recognizes his face and is even more worried since he was also beaten and they have always been friendly. There can be no violence in their family. 
The hero salivates at the sight of the delicious kebab, which he associates with childhood. Michael is enjoying the dish when a chair flies past him, which he successfully smashes with his magical powers, already in a fighting mood. Three big guys burst into the cafe, who notice that the guy is not a failure, but today they need a store so he can finish eating and leave. The owners of the establishment had clearly already met these guys, fearfully calling the leader Tiger. The Tiger runs into an old acquaintance of Michael, forcing him to pay for security, starting a skirmish. The big man threatens that he knows where the cafe is moving and therefore threatens to destroy it too if he doesn't have $50,000 tomorrow. The Tiger condescendingly recommends that Michael leave and the hero sharply replies that it would be better for them to leave. The big man is irritated by such insolence and is about to show Johnson that he cannot be joked with like that, but Michael knocks the wind out of him with one blow. The owners of the establishment are shocked that this guy knocked out the creator of their problems so quickly that they didn't even have time to see, and Michael wonders if everything is fine with them. The tiger comes to his senses and, with a wild scream, attacks the young small business advocate in a sharp counterattack. Michael counters the attack with a sharp uppercut that sends his opponent's head crashing into the ceiling, landing him on the next floor. Tiger's henchmen are shocked by what they saw and don't know what to do now, looking at their boss, who is stuck in the ceiling. The main character, spraying his aura everywhere, clearly explains to the extortionists that he promises to give them a good reception if they show up here again. The gang sits on their knees in front of Michael, begging for mercy and promising that they will never allow themselves to do this again and will not dare to disturb the owners of this establishment. And then they run away, released by the young guy. Johnson examines the mess in the cafe that was left after their fight and thinks that it would be good to force the villains to clean up here before letting them go. The owners ask the guy if he is Michael by chance, to which he joyfully remarks that they forgot him. Everyone is glad that they met an old friend. The owners of the establishment notice that Johnson has always been different from the other visitors, so they could not forget him. Michael returns to Jessica's apartment late in the evening and asks if she is home. The hero finds the girl and asks why she didn't answer his calls. Then she turns to face Johnson, and it turns out that it is not Jessica at all, but Sarah Walsh herself. Michael doesn't quite understand what this girl forgot at his friend's house, but she comes up with an excuse, to which she asks why he lives here. He says that Jessica sheltered him for a while. Michael notices that Sarah looks great and doesn't need anyone's help at all, although the master sent him to her. They begin to talk, and during a two-way interrogation they realize that neither of them can contact Jessica. Then Michael fears that she has become a target for his enemies. Young Johnson abruptly takes off in search of his girlfriend, and Mrs. Walsh is shocked that after everything he takes her and leaves her, although he himself had recently been looking. Sarah is not ready to put up with the insolence of a guy who has a recipe that she needs and decides to come up with an approach to it. Michael left, and she wonders what kind of person he is, because there is no information on him in the public domain, and comes to the conclusion that it exists, but is protected by higher authorities. Such a guy can be useful for the company but it will not be easy to control him. The girl cannot come to terms with the loss of such a shot and therefore decides to achieve him at any cost since this is very important for her company and he himself was the first to come to her. Michael wanders alone through the night in New York, realizing that the city is too big and he has no information and therefore it is not possible to find Jessica alone. He is afraid of being late. The hero decides to resort to the alliance of the person with whom he promised to no longer have anything in common but realizes that now this is his only way out. John Locke stands in his luxurious office in the middle of a luxurious building that completely belongs to him and looks at the panorama of the city. His phone rings. He thinks out loud that no more than six people on the entire planet know this number and therefore this call definitely means something. Michael threatens John not to try to trace the call or find the caller. Otherwise, he will take away everything he has given him, including his life and then asks for help in finding the director of Apple named Jessica Nightingale, who has not been in touch for 10 hours. Then he explains that he should have information about this person in the next five minutes and hangs up, leaving the listener in nervous confusion. A man with an interesting tattoo on his arm says that he kept this phone for three years and was looking forward to this call. John tells Michael that Jessica is now in the hospital because she received a call about the critical condition of some patient. She is still there, she needed an urgent operation. The director has already managed to sell a car for 50000 while she was there. Mrs. Nightingale is in a very upset state. She has already connected all her finances and even sold the car, but there is still not enough money for the operation. 
Jessica's parents say that they have also already collected all their money and even contacted distant relatives with whom they have tense relations and have not communicated for a long time. Jessica's uncle, who obviously has a lot of money, arrived at the hospital and wonders what had to happen for them to start looking for him. Relatives beg to borrow money for the operation, but the uncle reports that his business is going through hard times and therefore he has no money. The uncle's wife notices that a match needs to be found for the son of an influential man and Jessica is beautiful and there is no doubt about it. If she gets married, her husband will be promoted. The aunt not very politely hints that if Jessica agrees to a marriage contract with the stupid son of a rich man, then they will have money for her brother's treatment. Jessica is shocked. Her uncle's wife says that this is the only solution available to solve their problem. The parents are against selling their daughter. A distant relative puts pressure on the girl, saying that her brother is only 14 years old. Can she really calmly watch him slowly die? You are his sister. But then from the door comes the inquiring cry of Michael, who is interested in who is going to marry off his girlfriend. He wonders why Jessica didn't tell him about her brother's illness. For him, as for her boyfriend, this is too much, and all the relatives are shocked by what is happening. Jessica's greedy distant relatives are trying to destabilize the guy, since they do not benefit from his existence. The girl, to prove that Johnson is her boyfriend, kisses him on the cheek, stunning even him. The uncle insists that not every man can afford to pay for such an expensive operation. Michael, with a smug look, reports that 400,000 is mere change. He paid for the operation on the way to the hospital. Johnson understands that he didn't have time to do this, but he's glad that he managed to get here before Jessica agreed to the marriage, even if he was found out. Michael laughingly reports that the money did not go to the hospital, but directly to the best doctor in New York, Johnson, who will cure the guy in no time. The uncle's wife remarks that for some reason she has never heard of this doctor. The hero thinks this woman should work as a detective, and he confidently replies that of course she didn't hear, because this doctor is himself. The uncle dies laughing from such a statement, and his wife says that if he is a doctor, then she is a god. Two doctors enter and ask the patient's relatives to be quiet. One of the doctors turns out to be Robert Clark's attending physician. This doctor immediately rushes to Michael as soon as he notices him, to warmly greet him as a true god of medicine. All the relatives are on the verge of fainting from what they heard from a highly qualified doctor. Michael tries to hide what happened in the Clark house, hinting to the doctor that they saw each other in the hospital. But the doctor does not accept the information received and directly reports where they saw each other before. Jessica's uncle is shocked that such a piece of trash as Johnson can be called a doctor and also be so widely known. The doctor gets tired of the constant performances of distant relatives and therefore he calls security, who immediately escorts them out of the premises. The doctor suspects that they may have rabies and suggests placing them in a dispensary to prevent the spread of the infection. Michael, hugging the doctor, says that despite his average skills, his methods are quite cruel to which the doctor remarks that they dared to disrespect the god of medicine and deserve such punishment. Jessica lightly tugs the guy's sleeve and asks him to help her brother. She and her family will definitely reimburse the cost of the operation. The doctor convinces the relatives that he will undertake the operation, and besides, he will do it completely free of charge as a token of Michael's merits. The guy doesn't stand aside and quickly writes something down on a piece of paper for a doctor he knows. The doctor reads the note and sees that it describes an ancient needle insertion technique that will greatly improve his work. Michael also takes out his card and wants to pay despite the doctor's previous words, but he strenuously refuses, saying that he will sort everything out himself. The relatives themselves are on the verge of ending up on the operating table from the exorbitant surprise they experience from everything that happened before their eyes in the last five minutes. The parents are very surprised that their daughter has a boyfriend and one who is capable of such actions. Upon leaving the hospital, Jessica's parents send her home to rest, saying that from now on, they themselves will be able to look after their son. Then the father calls his daughter over and says that he and Michael, while they are not yet married, should not forget about contraception, leaving Jessica very embarrassed. Michael, who heard this, further confuses the already hurt girl, saying that he did not think that her father was so concerned about safety. Jessica, blazing with anger and embarrassment, screams at Michael because he overheard someone else's conversation, to which he only notes that he just has keen hearing. Finishing the conversation, Jessica is about to go home by car, but remembers that she pawned it, and therefore will try to return it tomorrow. The guy pretends that he doesn't understand what Jessica is talking about, and says that she left him the keys to her car. The girl rushes into Johnson's arms, warmly thanking him, who clearly did not expect such an outburst of feelings. Already behind the wheel of the car, 
Mrs. Nightingale wonders why Michael is helping her so much, to which he reports that she may find out about it tomorrow. The girl feels the cold, saying that the air conditioner is broken, but Johnson realizes that, unfortunately, everything is not so simple. He feels the spirit of extermination nearby. The guy asks Jessica to follow all his instructions exactly, and he jumps out of the car, informing her that she needs to return home to her apartment and not stop, so that she doesn't hear behind her. Next, the girl needs to hide in Michael's room and call the last contact from his phone and ask him to send the strongest person to her within 30 minutes. And when people come, don't resist. Wait for me. Michael is left alone on the road, watching Jessica's car go around the corner. A black car drives up to him, from which two figures get out. The guy says that it's time to meet the enemy. The man who killed his family five years ago appears before him, declaring that he did not think that anyone from the Johnson family was still alive. Michael asks if the man wants to kill him, and he laughs and says that the guy is real trash and doesn't deserve him to want to kill him and sets his driver on. The villain lunges at Johnson, who stands in the same unchanged position, ignoring the threat. The hero delivers his signature blow, knocking back his defeated opponent, calling him a weakling. The main villain says that it was useless to give such a weakling a chance. The man admires the perfection that Michael has achieved in five years. Today, Liam Sparks himself will let him die. The hero notices pointedly that his opponent is talking too much nonsense. The handsome man begins his speech by revealing that he was the one who killed the entire Johnson family five years ago. Liam invites Michael to be his loyal dog instead of the guy the last Johnson just killed. The main character reports that Sparks takes on too much, relying on his amateurish kung fu. The young hero wonders if his opponent has noticed that his main weakness is illusion, and multiple images of dark spirits appear behind him. Michael flares with the quintessence of all his power and strength, and warns that he will not allow the murderer of his family to die so easily, like his subordinate. The main villain cannot believe that there is such a young master in America. He himself cultivated for 40 years, spent countless efforts and wealth, and only barely became a master. Even if he doesn't understand how the guy achieved such a result in such a short time, nevertheless, the gap in their experience is colossal. Liam screams about his intention to blow Michael's head off and burning with anger rushes to attack. Young Johnson blocks his opponent's deadly attacks, ignoring his skill and knowledge. Michael notices that Sparks was able to cause minor damage to him in the form of scratches on his arms, albeit more severe than he expected. Liam, spewing blood from his eyes and mouth, is horrified to discover that he broke his fingers during the attack on Johnson. Michael, with a smug smile that even the spirits of darkness behind him would envy, wonders if this is the gap in experience his opponent was talking about. The main character, blazing with magic and hatred, shouts that today Liam Sparks, the killer of the Johnson family, will pay in blood for his actions and rushes to the attack. The villain reassuringly notices that Michael decided to attack him in the air and believes that this is his chance to win thinking that the opponent is still extremely inexperienced. Sparks concentrates all his power in his left hand and performs a critical blow with it, cutting off the legs of the last Johnson. The main villain, with a smug smile, arrogantly asks how Michael plans to fight without legs, but after a moment, with horror in her eyes, she realizes that it was only a transformed illusion, calling on a higher kingdom. Johnson at this moment makes his true blow, filled with the full power of his magic from the back of his doomed opponent. With the blow of the main character, Liam is slammed into the road, breaking off huge pieces of the roadway with his body. Michael is in the night, standing over the sight of his enemy's defeat, blazing with magical power. He notices that the opponent is still alive and says that the villain, as befits a master, is stubborn. Sparks, his face crumpled from the blow, whispers that the guy's superiority over him is impossible. Michael lifts Liam Sparks by the hair and invites him to answer one question and then the guy will think about whether to burn his enemy alive. He wonders who told Sparks about Johnson's existence, and how many others know this. The enemy wonders whether he will really be released if he tells everything. In a very angry manner, Michael shows that his opponent is in no position to negotiate terms with him, and slams his head into the asphalt. Sparks says that he saw photos of the hero on the internet, and because he does not like to be in danger, he instructed his people to find and follow him, and arrive to deal with him. The Dragon Lord said that none of the Johnson family should survive in the end. Michael slams his soul into Sparks' back and demands to know the real name of the Dragon Lord. Liam reports that he has not had direct contact with the Dragon Lord, since he is not worthy to even know his name. Johnson wonders why then the Dragon Lord decided to attack his family, whether his father really insulted him. The Dragon Lord only said that he was looking for something, 
and in the end his search led him to the Johnson family, and Michael remembers the stone that the old man gave him. If the Johnson family has anything worthwhile, it's a cemetery rebirths. They hear some kind of rumble, then the bastard reports that his people have already reached Michael's girlfriend, so he can spend his time killing. But then it's not a fact that Jessica will survive. The hero once again presses the enemy's head into the asphalt, reminding that it is not Sparks who sets the conditions here. Meanwhile, Jessica gets to her house, but feels that someone is following her. She realizes that she needs to get home quickly. Running inside, she remembers that she needs to hide in Johnson's room and call the last number dialed earlier. Locke listens to Jessica's instructions on the phone about calling the strongest person to her as soon as possible. The girl, screaming, asks to be faster, since someone has already broken down the door. A bunch of unknown aggressive people are standing near Jessica's door, listening to the instructions of the main one. While Jessica calls Locke, the enemies make their way up the stairs towards her. The man quickly ends the conversation. The girl does not understand why she hung up and thinks that she called the police. John loses his temper, not understanding what kind of bastard wants to harm his master. He orders his two best people to immediately go to Jessica to protect her, and if something happens to her, they will be personally responsible to him, and also asks him to prepare a helicopter. He is flying to New York today. His people report that there will be an important meeting tomorrow, and he cannot cancel everything like that, to which Locke snaps to tell everyone gathered that he will not come. Meanwhile, Liam's men break into Jessica's apartment and actively search for her. Jessica, panicked that they are so close, notices that something is wrong with the door to Johnson's room. It seems to be glowing. One of the thugs says that he will kill the girl quickly if she comes out to them on her own. But the second one says not to listen to the first one and shouts that he will slowly torture her. The chief reports that today they must do without the murder since there has been no contact with Mr. Sparks for some time and the plan could change. However, he also means that he doesn't forbid playing with it for a while, leaving his colleagues delighted. One of them hits the door with all his might, but it does not give in under this inhuman pressure and the striker is shocked that the door remains intact after his attack. The one who hit the door lights up with a blue flame and fiery spirits gather around his head, filling him with flame from the inside. The burned thug falls to the floor with hellish screams and stops moving. His accomplices do not believe that he is dead. The smartest one notices that this door cannot be dealt with by brute force. This time Mr. Sparks came across someone who is not so easy to kill. One of them offers to open the lock of this door, taking out from his pocket the tools necessary for breaking. Jessica sits on Michael's bed in horror and realizes from the sounds that someone seems to have died behind her door. She sees how the door begins to slowly open and from behind it a hand and a mask appear. The man wearing it frighteningly says that he has come. Jessica is horrified to hear compliments on her beauty from these thugs. She does not understand at all what they are going to do to her. Three strange figures in costumes and masks stand in front of her. One of them says that she lost her brother trying to catch her, and therefore the girl will have to compensate for this. The same figure reaches out to Jessica, and she, blue with horror, prays for Michael to save her. Out of nowhere, a throwing knife flies by and pierces the offender's head right through, leaving him no chance of survival. The figure of Locke's assistant appears in the window, who was supposed to come to Jessica's aid. The thugs are very angry because of the loss of another brother, and even the blow was dealt on the sly. A second bodyguard appears from behind and plunges a knife into the skull of another masked man. The main thug, left alone and hearing that the bodyguards have arrived on Locke's orders, realizes that he has no chance of life. He tries to surrender but is too late, because one of the guards has already prepared a fatal blow for him. The bodyguards bow to Jessica, saying that they are Mr. Johnson's men, and Jessica does not believe that she is saved. Michael drags his enemy to the cemetery, carelessly dragging him along the ground by the collar. He throws the body near the grave of his parents, and he turns to them, saying that he came to see them on the anniversary of their death. Michael kicks Liam's mangled body and demands to kneel in front of his parents. Sparks mutters that he is the master of an entire generation. It is impossible for him to kneel in front of ordinary people and ask to kill him. Johnson again grabs him by the hair and hits him against the tiles six times in a row to convey to the cripple the seriousness of the guy's intentions. And then he decides to make a sacrifice to his parents, dealing with Sparks. He swears that everyone who was associated with the tragedy in their villa will be personally sent to hell to atone for their sins. In the morning, Jessica appears at the cemetery with flowers. The sun is shining around her. She talks about what a busy day it was yesterday and what a mysterious person Michael is. At first, she mistook him for a charlatan who looked like a former deceased classmate. She would never have thought that it could be him. 
The stream of thoughts is interrupted by the fact that she discovers Michael at the grave, drunk, at the very grave where that classmate and his family are buried. Jessica realizes that he was her old acquaintance all this time. She understands that she should have guessed earlier. Now the girl understands the origins of the reasons why the guy protected her and tried to solve her problems. She considers herself stupid for not noticing this earlier. She cannot imagine what he had to go through and hugs him tightly. Jessica sympathizes with Johnson, understands how much pain he was in, and says that now he won't have to go through all this alone. She turns to the grave of his parents and says that she did not believe that Michael would return. But now, she will look after him and will not allow him to do anything stupid, even though he has already grown into a good, worthy man. The guy wonders where Jessica came from here because he's still drinking, to which she exclaims that it's time for him to stop. He needs to go home. Jessica takes a drunk Michael home to shower and go to bed. The embarrassed guy realizes that Jessica is not his wife to take care of him so much, and she replies that until he finds a wife, she will perform duties for her. Michael thinks that maybe this is exactly what his parents would like to see instead of revenge for them. Three hours after the couple leaves, Lucy Vox appears at the cemetery and discovers the sacrificed Liam Sparks at the grave of the Johnson family and does not understand who could have done this. She puts the death of the Burke family and this murder in her head and realizes that they are somehow connected. She wants to immediately check all the cameras near the cemetery to find out who did it. Jessica and Michael sleep peacefully in bed in the apartment, but are awakened by a knock on the door. A sleepy Jessica wonders who is knocking on the door. Michael argues that he doesn't often drink too much, and then notices that the girl somehow ended up in his bed. He ironically asks if she really desires him, to which Jessica sharply and angrily replies that she doesn't need him. They have a nice fight, and the girl says that he is a bad guy who got drunk and slept with her in his arms, so she only thinks about how to get rid of him. Their argument continues, Michael notes that Jessica is his temporary wife and therefore should hug him, and the girl says that it is not normal for him to be so drunk and reek of fumes. Jessica asks Johnson to open the door since she can't do it like this. Michael heads towards the door. Anna Clark appears at the threshold. The hero is very surprised by her arrival. She reports that Michael promised to come to her father for dinner, but he did not answer his calls, so she decided to come to him. The girl notices the guy's athletic physique, which she had not noticed before and Michael makes an appointment at seven o'clock in the evening at a certain place. The Clark family realizes that they do not know where Mr. Johnson's name is located, but their driver sarcastically remarks that he knows where it is. Robert talks about the high cost of the restaurant they are going to, and the driver says that this is just a street with eateries and shops where the price of a dish does not exceed a couple of dollars. Father and daughter are confused by this news. The owners of the diner do not understand what kind of car drove up to them, but they know very well that it is terribly expensive. They do not understand how a person with such a car could come to their restaurant. Michael and the girl appear behind them and joyfully announce that it was he who called them and it's time for the owners to set the table. Mr. Clark, stepping out of the car, immediately understands why Johnson chose this place, but his driver and daughter do not share his enthusiasm. Everyone sits down at a simple but extensive table with a bunch of tasty and juicy shish kebab from Michael's childhood. Robert argues that the food here is really delicious, but there are no customers at all. He decided that this needs to be corrected at all costs. Having heard the orders of a rich man to his subordinate, the owners of the cafe are perplexed about how powerful this man is, and the reason he is here is Michael. Johnson thanks Clark for helping the establishment and takes a direct interest in the Tizen Group, which was previously owned by his family. The businessman says that after the incident five years ago, the future of the company became very unclear and wonders why Michael needed information about this company. Suddenly it dawns on him, and he realizes that Michael Johnson is the same heir to the company who supposedly died that day along with his parents, but he learned medicine and returned. Michael understands that his interlocutor has already guessed everything, but still says that he wants to revive the company and asks Robert what he knows. Then Clark says that now the main share belongs to Dick Lawrence. Michael understands that he will never forget this name because it was a friend of his parents, an uncle whom he always trusted. But it was he who gave his father the invitations to that damned party when his parents were dead. He smiled to please the man from Washington. Jessica, seeing Michael flare up, tries to calm him down by placing her hand on his shoulder, to which he replies that she doesn't need to worry and he's fine. Clark wonders if he understands Johnson correctly, that he wants to unite and return the Tizen group to its former greatness. Anna notices that her father is shaking. She believes it is from nerves, but soon realizes that it is from his determination to team up with Michael Johnson. 
Michael asks if Robert is afraid for his family, to which he replies that businessmen always strive for money, and if he can count on 10% of the profit, then he is in business. Jessica notices that Clark has changed his usual strategy in order to continue collaborating with Johnson. Michael decides to agree to the businessman's proposal, since he seems sincere, and in return says that he will always help his family. The couple walks through town happy, discussing how Michael's father would be happy if he could bring the company back. The hero understands the surveillance, but understands that these are the people of John Locke who sent them for protection. On the way home, Jessica suggests dinner, to which Michael replies that he is not hungry. Michael is going to thank Locke for saving his girlfriend. Johnson makes an appointment with his agent, preparing to meet him at eight in the evening at the Imperial Club, where they will not be disturbed. Michael wonders who this John Locke is, because he invited him to the coolest club in New York. You can't even get into it for money, and it belongs to John himself. Lucy Vox, in company with an unknown man, head to the Imperial Club, discussing the death of Liam Sparks. She proves to her father that it was not an accident, since at the last moment someone erased all the evidence. The club is full of various martial arts masters. Today there are many more of them, even strong ones have appeared. They talk about an old man who is a local administrator. It is because of his strength that the club has nothing to do with politics. Lucy wonders why a club with such power has not crushed all the families in New York. Her father explains that the reason lies in the man behind that powerful master. His name is John Locke, and he is the governor of the entire region. Lucy understands what powerful power this man has, and her father asks her not to think about the governor, since the difference between them is too great. The daughter and father split up to unwind before an important meeting. She can't get Sparks' sacrifice to the Johnson family out of her head, even though they should all be dead. She wonders if any of them could have survived, and notices Michael. The girl thinks that Johnson could not have been here, since he would have been a beggar if he had survived. But no one would mind if she personally verified her theory. Lucy greets Michael nicely, but then says that she misspoke and mistook him for an old acquaintance. She notices that since the guy ended up in this club, he can't help but know her, and therefore hands over her business card and tells him to contact her if he needs help. Michael, in a rage, knocks the card out of the girl's hands and asks if he heard correctly about the Vox family. The girl is confused by the guy's impudence, and he is even more persistently trying to drive her away. The girl does not tolerate such an attitude towards her family and is going to slap the impudent man in the face. Then an administrator appears who demands that this stop immediately. Lucy tries to start a conversation with the great master, advertising her origins, but he brushes her off and shouts at her to get out because he doesn't care about her and her family, and if she doesn't get out now, then she won't set foot in the Imperial Court Again Club. The girl, terribly offended, quietly leaves because she doesn't want big trouble. The master begins a conversation with Michael, noticing that Locke still has not arrived for the meeting, although the time has already come, and suggests that something might have happened along the way, but the governor will be here soon. The administrator wonders why this guy can be so disrespectful to the governor himself, who he should be. Here John Locke appears in person along with his bodyguard. The master bows to the governor and his power, greeting him in every possible way, noting that he is still as strong as a year ago. Michael annoyedly reports that Locke was a full two minutes late from the appointed time. He made him wait so long. The governor kneels before Johnson and asks him not to be so angry. The entire governor's retinue is shocked that their ruler is kneeling before some nameless guy. Locke calls Michael the Lord and says that it was not easy for him anyway and behind him his subordinates understand that this guy is the same legendary lord that the governor has been talking about for a long time. 